Can I acknowledge the traditional owners uh, and thank uh, members uh, of the Wurundjeri people for their custodianship of the land on which we gather today. Apologies to Michael Kirby for anything I might say that uh, might in fact not be approved uh, by him. And indeed apologies to you because while I'm absolutely honoured to be here and delighted I could be this year, I uh, certainly uh, am not a High Court judge and uh, frankly wouldn't have the skills or even for me the audacity to aspire to be such uh, a, an esteemed Australian. But uh, I'm, I'm particularly delighted to be able to talk to you about community. You heard I grew up in a small town community. It was the stuff of not just your family but your neighbours, your networks, the sort of uh, the uh, framework in which you felt secure as a child growing up knowing that people around you cared about you, that the aspirations of your family and other families was to actually uh, build a secure future for the children in their care. And of course, uh, we all grew up with aspirations, particularly for my generation, that things would improve. It might have been uh, a little um, rosy-eyed uh, in a sense, but we, you know the adage, it's a pretty easy one, all of us shared it. Our parents convinced us if we got a good education, if we uh, got a good job and uh, could uh, um, build a, a family, invest in our own homes, make a difference where you can, that life would increasingly be better generation by generation. Well, it really distresses me that the word community appears to have dropped from our political lexicon. Now, of course, with Rhonda and others of you in the room and Joan Kerner over there who uh, deal every day in advocacy around community, then it's, uh, it is a little uh, audacious of me to talk about this, but the community for union people is equally as important. We are members of a community. We are part of our own community networks. We see our membership as family as well as friends. We understand that the fabric and the strength of a collective culture is to stand up with and for each other. And so it is, seems to me that it's not just the word community that seems to have been dropped. It's the whole idea of the collective base of our community that seems to have been lost in favour of a very narrow definition and debate of economic prosperity, as if you can actually divorce that from the well-being of people more generally. And as a result of this, communities are actually dropping off the edge in Australia. If you read uh, a recent report by the Jesuit Social Services and the Catholic Services of Australia, which Joe tells me he's already mentioned, then they have mapped out uh, the communities that are struggling to keep their heads above water under a government which has watched the alarming growth in indebtedness in families and then sought, frankly, to scare them with false uh, economic claims and a false sense of debate about our economy, its prosperity and what it's indeed uh, supposed to be for. If you take just one snapshot of a Victorian community from that report, I was flicking through it this morning uh, and came across an area you all know well called Gibbsland. And that, of course, spreads across two federal electorates. But it actually says that this uh, area includes four of the top 10 most disadvantaged communities in Victoria. Four of the top 10 in two federal electorates. The reason I raise this is if you identify what the uh, characteristics of, those of that disadvantage is, and of course it hasn't sprung up overnight. It's been a gradual and an identifiable transition to the point where we can now say that some of those communities are bordering on being in crisis. The major characteristics, of course, identified by the report go to uh, low family income, <coughs> early school leaving, limited computer and internet use, high unemployment and underemployment, domestic violence, criminal convictions and lack of qualifications. All these factors in turn lead to isolation and eat away at the reality of community. That picture is occurring in too many regional and rural communities. I know it, you know it, as well as, of course, in our urban communities where there's an even greater sense of isolation if that's possible. But this report is a wake-up call. It's worth reading and we should all heed the danger signs 
that, uh, in fact, as tired as you are, should strive for us to advocate louder and harder about public policy to turn around this level of disadvantage in an otherwise rich nation. The sad fact is that Australia is heading in the wrong direction and it's taking its communities with it. We've had uh, 16 years now of economic growth, yet families are working harder, not just to get ahead, but not to get ahead, but just to keep what they've got. Just to keep what they've got. We're out of step with the international community, a debate I've been rather emblazoned in today, and, uh, and embedded rather than addressing the negative aspects of, uh, and embedding rather than addressing the negative aspects of social dimension of globalisation. When you actually look at the pressure on families and communities, then there's no doubt that the government can claim that economic prosperity is indeed the case. They're keeping corporate profits and share prices at record highs. But the household budgets of working families under, are under more pressure than ever. For uh, four interest rate rises since 2004, creating mortgage or rent hikes, and indeed escalating prices for essentials. Petrol, it's, people still name petrol as the thing that frightens them most in, uh, in terms of the rise, after interest rates, in terms of the rise in costs. Food, and I've been distressed to see recently that families are talking about, not that they can't feed their children, but they're worried about the quality of food they can now put on the table. Uh, housing, childcare, health and education record levels of indebtedness and the insecurity of take-home pay due to, of course, the IR laws that are placing families under inordinate stress. When you think about uh, not only the IR laws and the fact that people have lost job security, income security, have no right to collective bargaining and, of course, are not uh, comforted by uh, the powers of the independent umpire any longer. So in fact, if you wanted to look at the current debate about the fairness test, then uh, you, it's not only got so many holes you could drive a truck through it, but if you're not content, having been forced to sign an AWA to get the fairness test applied, if you're not content with the decision by one person in the first and last instant in a secret process for which there is no transparency at all, then you have to go to the High Court to actually get some form of redress and then only on legal proceedings. It's a little akin to the, uh, the, you know, the movie The Castle where you simply say, you're dreaming. I mean, what working person would even think that they would have access to the High Court, let alone afford the cost of it, simply to work out whether their, their employment contracts were fair or not? But this is the level of denial of fundamental rights that working people now face in Australia. Unfortunately, that's not it. Today, of course, I was accused of uh, smearing Australia's name. I've pointed out that uh, um, many of us stand up for Australia every day, but we stand up for an, a decent Australia. And if it's now a crime to actually advocate the uh, um, implementation of international law to which this government is a signatory, to stand up for injustice in our own land, in every tribunal, then I'm guilty as charged because we can't afford to back off. We simply can't afford to back off and leave a legacy that uh, the IR laws would leave for our children and grandchildren. But it goes way beyond the daily stuff of, uh, of, of my advocacy and the advocacy of union leaders, delegates, members and other activists in our communities. It actually goes to many other areas of our public policy. Punitive welfare to work laws that punish single mothers or the disabled and the sick who are temporary unab temporarily unable to work simply don't make sense to me. They just don't make sense socially or economically. I, uh, I look at the statistics and shake my head when I understand and you understand that single mums are in the workplace to the same extent almost as coupled mothers by the time their children go to high school. Now, you know, what are we really saying here? That children don't deserve the care of the only parent they've got in their most vulnerable years where the, uh, where the woman chooses that? That's just unbelievable. I might tell the, the, uh, this community 
who uh, we all feel very close to, that in fact uh, this is personal. I was a single mum at the age of uh, 19 and it was Gough Whitlam's single mother's pension that meant that I could actually go to university. I could make a choice to have my child and go to university. And for the several years of support that the Australian community gave women like me, I think we've given an enormous amount back to the community, both through the raising of our children and indeed through the work we do through the rest of our, uh, our world. So it makes me particularly angry to see that we have not got welfare to work laws that encourage people into jobs, which is the heart and soul of my work, but in fact punish people who, as I said, are temporarily unable to work or indeed are uh, amongst the most vulnerable people in our communities. That's pretty shocking, but it's just one set of wrongs in a sea of damage to the Australian ethos of a fair go that still, I think, uh, is the dreams of people who want to build and rebuild communities. The government's presided over the emergence of a massive shortage in skills while we have uh, unacceptable levels of youth unemployment. And, uh, and of course, uh, as I travel around Australia visiting different communities, you continue to see, despite the macro statistics, in alarming levels of unemployment and underemployment. And it is simply not that easy. It is not that easy to find yourself out of work one day and walk into a job the next. On Insight last night, I was listening to the young people telling their stories. And you can't help but reflect what kind of world it is where people are frightened about getting a job at age 15 or 16 or 17 or 18, but then walking into a job where they have no idea of their rights. And one young man who was actually uh, not paid for six weeks in a local business, and then when uh, his mother pursued it finally all the way to a union who wrote a letter and he was finally paid, not paid for 11 hours of training. That You sort of reflect on what that says to young people about the way in which they're treated in their first job. But what I was reflecting on most was his courage. He pursued that all the way through the uh, Office of Workplace Services to the courts and he actually won a major victory at age 15 for young people all around the country. And that was that it was declared to be illegal for young people not to be paid for periods of induction or training. Now, not many people will know about that, but it's the courage of people like that, and particularly the young people in our midst, who I think will build the heart and soul of uh, future communities, particularly for those people who are not picked up in the official statistics of the land. People are struggling. And unfortunately, we've got uh, levels of government, particularly the federal government, that refuse to even acknowledge this and work with us to try and do something about it. So rather than um, provide opportunity and optimism for our young people, this government has systematically put the price of university entrance out of the reach of children of working parents and turned back the clock in terms of the privatisation of university places. Now they're talking about loans for TAFE, on the agenda. We've already seen, of course, the Education Minister continually undermine and insult the professional work and integrity of teachers, another matter that's a little personal, in our uh, public schools. It is disgraceful conservative rubbish and it's designed to distract the nation from the fact that they've underfunded our community schools, our public schools, by $2.9 billion. Our children, Australia's children, deserve a lot better than that. There is a silence or lame excuse for the misuse of 457 visas that shame a proudly immigrant nation by allowing our young people to go without work while seeing the sons and daughters of neighbouring countries exploited. Then there is the despair of families over the cost of childcare, with up to a million potential workers outside the labour force at a time when we need, all, we could need to do all we can to encourage participation then investment in quality childcare that's affordable will reap significant dividends in terms of more workers, increased tax, wo uh, tax revenue and early childhood development. But above all, it will alleviate real financial stress for families. All it takes is the political will to care for the children of working people. In fact, the cost of childcare has risen by over 12% in the past year, 
The Liberal Party's response to this, of course, was on the weekend was astonishing. Subsidies for nannies. Well, we wish. <laughs> Particularly to the women in the, in the room, we wish. And yet, you know, we don't because we have a bigger sense of community than that. We're happy to have our young children cared for by professionals who are appropriately paid for their skills. And of course, that's not the case. And we ha are happy to have them develop in uh, both social and intellectual terms with the children in our community. Wouldn't it be nice to wake up and hear a fight about what levels of universal provision of childcare the nation could afford and what the economic dividend would be that it would reap, rather than simply uh, the, uh, the um, policy positions that uh, will work for one group or the other, but not for all. Australians are willing to pay for childcare. They're willing to pay for public education. They're willing to pay for a quality health system in which we can all share. Yet uh, it would appear that we would rather pro prop up the profits of an inefficient private health insurance industry than make Medicare work for everyone. And then, of course, public housing is not even on the priority list, despite the levels of homelessness and the extreme financial stress of many families living in poverty. When more than half of Generation X, they're my kids, the children of many of us here, when they say they've given up on the dream of ever owning their own home, then surely affordable housing must rate a higher priority than just a political swipe at the state governments. What does it do to the intergenerational wealth and security and the dignity of retirement incomes for working people if the dream of owning your own home is uh, entirely dissipated? And then, of course, uh, for those people struggling with uh, rent hikes, particularly, again, our most vulnerable, either at uh, the beginning of their working lives or indeed at the end of them, well, it just seems that if we are such a rich nation, we must be able to do better. The fact is that it's uh, harder to uh, either uh, invest in the dream of owning your own home in Australia or indeed simply to pay the rent on a fortnightly basis than it's been in economic terms, in financial stress terms and for any other generation in the last few decades. Then, of course, you've got infrastructure, industry policy, innovation, all the things that generate smart jobs, all suffering neglect, with our export of high-end manufacturing falling into negative territory for the first time in decades. If you looked in 2006, we had a record 17% uh, of high-value-added manufacturers, the stuff that we uh, actually use our brains to make being exported. And, of course, um, it's now down to a very sad, in fact, uh, almost unbelievable level of 0.2%. That's the neglect and the vandalism that's occurred because we haven't invested in skills and in R&D in industry policy, and again, despite being the rich nation we are. We are just a very, very lucky nation that we have had an economic boom due to the resources sector. But uh, beyond the current uh, boom in that sector, then we are not tending to the fundamentals. Ultimately, this neglect can only mean the loss of more jobs in manufacturing in our communities, the loss of decent jobs for our future, and an economy that's increasingly dependent just on what we can dig up and sell while we import all the smart stuff. 15 years of solid economic growth, I would argue, has been squandered, and uh, we could have used that economic growth and prosperity to build and galvanise the community feeling in Australia rather than fostering the distrust and the isolation that is all too uh, fortunately on, unfortunately on display. If you just think about what, have, what could have been done over the past 15 years with this once in a generation prosperity, when you think about it, then you wonder why we haven't invested in public education, real investment, in making higher education more obtainable rather than more expensive, better access to uh, childcare assistance, solving the Indigenous disadvantage and bridging the gap that we know is still there, more local community development programs, and the list goes on. Our mayors who are in the room struggling, as we know, to uh, on inadequate budgets to build community every day could have done much with just a small proportion of the budgetary surpluses that have accumulated. All of these things could have but helped to build a fairer and more equitable Australia. And yet, when you think that uh, Fred Argy, that uh, amazing economist, uh, 
actually wrote a book that I didn't believe in the early 90s that said the death of egalitarianism is dead. Well, if the death of egalitarianism was dead in the early 90s, then we've certainly lived through the process of seeing it well and truly buried. And we've got to do much better than that. Your work deserves much more attention. It deserves more funding. It, uh, it deserves the kind of respect that says that your advocacy should be listened to. And I won't go into other issues, but we should at least, at least list them. Climate change is a political battle against, uh, which, uh, against which no one should be standing. And yet uh, it's ironic that uh, the government's only just realised that it's out of step with the community and that it must appear to have a plan for the planet. The impact of water shortages are frightening people. The challenge of safe energy alternatives should be seeing unco unprecedented cooperation with state and local governments rather than the kind of battleground for a national takeover of community assets that we're seeing on the uh, agenda today. You can't have policy solutions to any of these things that are just developed by a few people out of self-interest. We must have policy solutions that are inclusive, that listen to people, that respond to local uh, situations and actually work for everybody. And I can't leave this uh, section without saying what I think about nuclear energy. It is unbelievable, I think, and maybe I'm just an unreconstructed 70s child, but uh, to impose nuclear energy on our children with no guarantee of safe technology or waste storage, with a half-life of hundreds of years, we know Australia will say yes to clean energy because they're saying it every day. But they are saying no to nuclear risk. When you don't have to, to leave that legacy to your children because you've got other alternatives, then again, I think it's just an indictment on a government who has uh, stopped listening to the people. When you uh, look at just a few other things, and I'll just list them, the constant attack on the independence of the ABC and uh, the continued participation in a war that Australia doesn't support, the abandonment of the right to a fair trial with the denial of presumption of innocence, the contempt for fundamental freedoms represented by the sedition laws and the authoritarian power of the Attorney General, the acceptance of uh, American interrogation procedures and the damage to Australia's long-held opposition to all forms of torture, <coughs> the scaremongering on native title, the encouragement of fear of difference in a multicultural society and the constant attacks on Australian Muslims, the determination to gag advocacy with the threat of defunding civil society organisations, and or the loss of charitable tax-free status for those that dare to speak out on behalf of the vulnerable, and the abolition of funding of, community legal, of Commonwealth legal centres and the attempt to gag the rest. These are things that you don't ha think could happen in our communities, that could happen in our backyard. We used to value people who stood up. We didn't always agree with them. People don't always agree with me. But when you stand up, and you actually speak out on behalf of your community, you have a right to do so, and you have a right not to be punished as a result. I must admit even I was uh, totally astonished, in fact it's pretty anger-making stuff, that when I went to address the uh, Community Legal Centres Conference in Wollongong a few months um, into last year, that uh, the Attorney-General took $25,000 off their budget not because they'd done anything to deserve that, but because I was on the agenda. I actually said to them, look, you know, you could have just asked me not to come, you know, that's pretty serious stuff. And they said, and they need to, you need to understand just how courageous our advocates are. They said, we won't be bullied like that. We know that we need to understand what your concerns are for working Australians and the, in and the industrial relations laws. And the only way we can understand that is to listen. If the Attorney General doesn't want us to do that, well then we'll actually uh, make up our own minds. Now those people are your, your colleagues. They're your colleagues, they're our neighbours, they're decent Australians standing up. And likewise, the churches, community groups and individuals who stood up for the rights of asylum seekers, for refugees, stood against the imprisonment of children and their parents, stood against the Pacific Solution, and stood against the insecurity of temporary protection visas. When Australians know something is wrong, they will stand up and fight.
And while we have uh, we've been shocked to see the public and visible attack on NGOs, the defunding of many NGOs because they've had an advocacy role, the um, the threat, of course, uh, to uh, their economic base so that they can continue to do the work that they do on behalf of us all, then you say something's gone wrong. Something's gone wrong in a democracy because in order to have healthy communities, we, of course, need to have uh, uh, freedom. We need to have a, a strong sense of democracy. We need to, to have humane public policy. And I'm pleased to be able to say to this group that uh, we have had such support, working Australians have had such support from communities right across the country that last year we decided we would give something back. And we uh, asked ACOS and uh, the Australian Conservation Foundation and the National Council of Churches to be our partners in starting something unique in Australia, a civil society dialogue at the national level, to actually bring civil society leaders and representatives of the communities that they advocate on behalf of, or with and on behalf of, to Canberra, to our parliament, and to talk about the things that mattered to us, that mattered to us as people who are community workers. We, out of that, it was such a rich dialogue and such an encouraging and optimistic discussion that out of that we decided that we would continue this dialogue, that we would hope to make it a more permanent feature on the landscape, that we would work towards the sort of outcomes that we could track progress, progress against, that we all agreed with, and we could uh, analyse public policy and track progress against, and that we would meet again to, to build a consensus about a 10-year set of, uh, of objectives for a decent Australia. What we plan to do is meet again uh, this year in a couple of months, and uh, what we hope to do this year is establish the kind of broad-based objectives with benchmarks underneath them that will allow us to analyse our own uh, progress as a nation in terms of our communities and the people who live within them. And while we are still, uh, while that's still a work in progress, the broad themes that we are talking about go to the heart of supporting the Bridging the Gap campaign for Indigenous Australia. Um, the establishment and the guarantee, I should say, through our laws of decent work for economic well-being. The, uh, the concept, of course, or the challenge, I should say, of addressing climate change solutions. And, of course, uh, the notion of healthier communities in all of its guise. Healthier communities where people feel included, where they have their needs met, where they feel safe, and, of course, where they have the fundamental services of health, education, housing, transport and the like. These things belong in any community, but they particularly belong in our communities, in a rich nation where people have fought for decades, where our parents and grandparents fought to build a decent Australia, where everybody could have the aspirations and indeed the freedoms that, uh, that go along with a set of, uh, of human rights and, uh, and, uh, and community uh, freedoms then we've got a lot to defend. In this nation, we have a lot to defend. We have done enormously good work, and you can talk about all of the positive things that come from your work. So can we. We are very proud, as I said uh, to a group of people last night, of the work that union members do. But we know that we've got a lot more to do, and it really is uh, the test that's set by Sir William Dean. He says that we judge ourselves by the way we treat the most vulnerable amongst us. So in that context, can I leave you with the thought that this year you have a very powerful uh, tool at your disposal. It's a right that everybody has in a democracy and it's the right to vote. People have the power to make a decision this year about what kind of Australia we want to be, whether we want to redress those issues that we are seeing diminish in our terms against the benchmarks we set at an alarming rate. I know that your work is, it will go on irregardless of the outcome of a democratic decision at this election, but it would be so much easier, I suspect, if we can genuinely make judgments about a political future where we're on the same team with people who listen. It doesn't matter what political party, but the fact that they, uh, that they listen to Australians, to working people, to their communities, to the families who, uh, who need assistance 
in a country where we should be standing with and for each other. In that context, we've got a bigger campaign, I think, to think about, and I would urge you to look at the, the uh, new Matilda's advocacy around a Human Rights Act. It's first and foremost the, uh, the only piece of uh, um, plain English legislation that I've seen drafted, so it's very easy to read. It's on their website, but it covers off, I think, the principles and beyond uh, time in this country, the articulation of those principles as rights within the context of the UN and the human rights framework that we would want to see as a basis for guaranteeing a legacy to our children and our grandchildren of decent, strong, caring communities. Thank you.